so i would like to introduce him uh, professor mohan kamishram actually does not need, need any introduction but still let me give a try so he is a managing director and senior consultant at murf he is a honorary senior lecturer at edge hill university in lancashire uk he has uh, received padma shri award by dr abdul kalam in 2006 He is recipient of Dr. B. C. Roy Award for the year 2008 by Dr. by Sri Pranam Mukherjee in 2016. He has also uh, received Indo Australian Award and for the sake of honor award. He is also the member of the governing body Asia Pacific Cochlear Implant Board. He has been elected as member executive board International Federation of Photo Laryngological Societies in Brazil. He. also is a board member of pulitzer society uh, which was uh, he was nominated in london in 2009 he is the president of asia he was the president of asia pacific symposium on cochlear implants and its related science he is also a visiting professor in otology by journal of laryngology and otology which is a very reputed journal he received the award lifetime achievement lifetime achievement award at 10th sark ent conference conducted at dhaka bangladesh in november 2016 he is the first surgeon in south and southeast asia to perform auditory brain in, brain stem implant and the first pediatric brain stem implant in asia in january 2009 he is a fellow of royal college of surgeons edinburgh fellow of international college of surgeons and fellow of tamil nadu academy of sciences he is the youngest ent surgeon to become a fellow of academy of medical sciences he has written over 125 publications in major international and national journals he has done more than 300 workshops on temporal bone and he visited almost over 45 countries for various academics and professional meetings he delivered more than 80 orations in many conferences uh, dr mohan kameshwaram sir regularly conducts mock ent test at murf to help the dnb students and he is a well known examiner in dnb oski exams conducted by the nat board of examinations so uh, i would like to request uh, sir to please start the session sir thank you thank you, for thank you sir thank you very much pradeep for those very kind words and first of all let me congratulate you on uh, you know doing a wonderful job i think this is a very useful exercise today it's also uh, given me some food for thought that i think that's the uh, quite a challenge uh, is for me too uh, i'm really enjoying this uh, uh, process thank you for that uh, i also understand that uh, sri harsha has been helping you uh, yes. on this has run foundation so thanks to him too yes he's now become an expert in uh, all this webinar i think and i think it's a future from what i can see so uh, today uh, in fact i have uh, uh, received questions uh, you know which students would like to know uh, are you seeing my presentation today uh, the yes sir we can see okay yes. right so i have received some questions from various quarters you know post graduates from uh, various places uh, on things they would like to know including our own post graduates here so i've tried to put together a, a, a kind of a format on addressing the question but before we do that let's have a, a little bit of a perspective about oski oski which stands for objective structured clinical examination at the uh, it was uh, was something which started quite early in 1979 uh, there was a very seminal paper from uh, university of dundee they were uh, the people who first put forth uh, the concept of an objective structured exam as you all know before that you know we had this traditional model of long case short case and so on uh, this was uh, a, a, a sort of a, 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 a you know a new concept and as all new concepts go there was quite a lot of resistance uh, i remember very well because i was in the uk then around that time and uh, you know i was in uh, Uh, very much uh, in the midst of it because i was at the exam going and we were all quite taken aback by this new concept and uh, there was a, a bit of a resistance then but slowly people realized that this is the way to go because you had to have an objectivity in exam to remove the subjectivity uh, you know and uh, make the exam fair to uh, all the candidates so this is how it started 
And now, uh, from Dundee, Dundee University is one of the oldest universities in, in Europe. Uh, but also, Dundee University was unusually uh, well suited for this because they were one of the first universities to have a separate department of medical education. Uh, you know, and that's how the whole thing started. And uh, you will remember that uh, we, as uh, in the medical profession, as, as doctors, we are the only, probably the only teaching faculty in the world who do not have a formal training in teaching at all. Uh, so, you know, we, we never uh, go through a, a proper uh, teaching uh, methodology course, but yet we all assume we are teachers. So this can do quite a lot of damage to the students. So this was uh, then realized and people started understanding that we have to have some formal training in teaching at all. This was taken up later on by McMaster's University in Canada, and they, you know, fine-tuned uh, the whole uh, process. And uh, then the OSCE exam came to stay. It became popular once Royal College of Surgeons uh, of Edinburgh accepted it as uh, a model on which uh, to conduct examinations. So OSCE was taken up at least as part of the Royal College examination. And then, of course, it became accepted worldwide because American uh, 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 exams also, the American board also adapted it and so on. But since then, it's now become standard. In, in India, of course, the first ASCII exam was held in Chennai. Uh, we were we organized it in Chennai. Uh, I was asked to do that by the national board because we had, some, we had previous experience organizing it. And uh, from then on, uh, you know, otolaryngology was the first specialty which took up OSCE exam in DNP. Uh, and I remember very well at that time when we conducted the exam, you know, we had people from all other specialties attending the exam just to observe how the exam was conducted. Now, of course, every other specialty is taken it up. So this is briefly about the, the history. But uh, the idea is that you want to have an exam which is fair, uh, where there can be no bias. You know, and uh, you do not uh, have, uh, supposing my uh, candidate comes for the exam. Uh, traditionally, what we used to do was, when, see, when I went for my FRC's exam, my boss was an examiner. So when I went in, the first moment he saw my walking into the room, he got up and went out, say, telling the boy examiner that he's my candidate, so I cannot be sitting here and went out. That is how we used to do it. But now, we, it doesn't matter whether even if your uh, own child is coming for the exam, as an examiner, there's only so much you can do. You cannot uh, really influence the uh, uh, outcome of the exam. So that is the, the, the best thing about the OSCE exam. And I think in India, particularly, it is something which is very relevant because otherwise, you know, this uh, so-called influence plays a very large part in examination that you have to take it out of the bias. So bias is something which is eliminated in this exam. Of course, there's nothing which is truly objective. Uh, you really the only truly objective exam is a theory exam you know where the candidate writes the answer the question, uh, questions everybody writes answers you don't know the name of the candidate or the number of the candidate and independent examiners are asked to evaluate it that's the only truly uh, you know objective exam but that's not a clinical exam that's a written exam so as clinical exams go the best format we have so far is OSCE exam so it is something which will actually benefit the cash student so you should not feel disturbed by it. It's definitely better than going and facing a traditional examination. Now, I will go through the exam in a, in a way as a candidate would go through and briefly talk about it. And then after that, you, you know, we'll look at specific uh, issues or questions that you will have in mind. Uh, as far as the theory exam is concerned, you know, you all have these uh, different papers uh, and you have to answer these papers. And part of the exam in theory is to assess the uh, readiness with which the knowledge is uh, communicated by the candidate. What do I mean? See, sometimes you will have questions which are very lengthy, which are passed as a short answer question. For example, let's say there's a question on uh, which says, uh, uh, describe the clinical features, uh, pathology, and management of autosclerosis. And it just comes in a short uh, question. Now, if this is something you can write for three or four hours, you know, but uh, the, the actual time it is given to you is, let's say, 10 minutes. So how do you approach this uh, problem? So here, you are being tested not only for your knowledge, but also for your time management. So you have to then develop uh, uh, strategies to develop this. How do you approach this? The 
clever candidate will put an outline. So an outline in which uh, the first beginning you say you put your ideas into the outline. So you say headings and then subheadings. So you say headings, say uh, the uh, uh, let's say pathology, and then clinical features, then uh, management. Then the subheadings in the pathology you start talking about the cross pathological features, then the uh, microscopic features, histopathology, and so on. So you subdivide it, put subheadings, and in the subheadings, then you write the keywords. So each uh, heading will have subheadings, and each subheading will have keywords. Underline the headings, subheadings, keywords. The idea is the examiner, the moment he looks at that outline and looks at the keywords, he knows that the candidate knows about it. So you convey to the examiner that you have already known their subject, and then whatever you write, you know, is fine because the candidate is, knows the subject, the examiner knows that the candidate knows the subject, and from then on, writing it, it doesn't matter, and you can put it in bullet forms. You don't have to write long sentences. So you are conveying as much as you can within the allocated time. But the outline is already there with all the matter in it. So the candidate, even if he is not, you know, writing long descriptive sentences. The matter is conveyed to them. So learn to manage your time. Don't sit and write a 10 minute question for one hour because then you're going to be affecting the other answers. And remember, every question carries the, the daily paper has the same marks. So you're not going to get more marks per question than what's allocated for that question. So that's about the theory. Now, coming to the OSCE, which is what we are talking about today. Now, the way the, the DNP exam is connected is that you have, let's say, two or three sentences. And uh, the, all the three centers will have on the same day. And uh, let's say there are, uh, you know, uh, 30 candidates in one day. Uh, if there are more than that, then maybe the exam will be current for two days, in which case uh, the questions also will change. But let's say that we have 30 candidates in a center A. And uh, you have uh, in that center, you have got about 35 stations and uh, three of them are rest stations. The other 32 are active stations. And you have to go through all the 32 stations. And you have five minutes in each station. Sometimes, very rarely, you may have 10 minutes, but that's very unusual, you know, usually five minutes per station. So you go through all the 35 stations, whether you like it or not, and uh, you have a time limit. And there are some stations in that which will be uh, based on the previous station. For example, there could be a, a description of uh, a history of a, of a particular candidate, of, of a particular patient, saying that this uh, 35 year old lady had come with the history of headache in the, you know, for the last 15 days, blurring of vision for the last uh, uh, 24 hours, and then uh, a history of nasal obstruction for uh, 15 days. And uh, the uh, candidate was examined. There was a mass qualified to mass seen in the left nasal cavity. And uh, the patient was asked to get a CT scan. And this is the findings of the CT scan. The next station would be the actual question. And in that station, they will be asking, what is this uh, scan which has been done? Describe the uh, positive findings of the scan. What, are the, what is your clinical diagnosis? It will be an AFRS, for example, with the involvement of the uh, orbital epics. How are you going to be uh, diagnosing it? And then any further investigations required? And then what is the presumed line of management? So let's let's say this second station is the active station. So when you are allocated stations, one candidate may be put on the first station, one candidate may be in the second station. The candidate who is the second station has not seen the first station yet. So that candidate will be asked to stand out until that five minutes over, and he, she or he or she will come back to that station at the very end and be given extra time for doing the station. So there'll be about three or four such stations where the candidate cannot answer because they're not seen in the previous station, which is the actual information containing station. So they will then go back to the station. So this is how it is done. So at the end of it, you'll have one more uh, uh, round or one more five minute extra time for that those candidates to see the, the station of the and then are completely answered. So do not carry the information from one or, or the problem from one station to another. In other words, if you're confused in one station, going to the second next station, 
forget about that you know and go and take that station fresh don't be uh, thinking about the previous station and confusion and, and not be answering the second station so learn to leave every station at that point and go on to the next station without any carry over or confusion from the previous station don't be mulling about the problem of the previous station when you are sitting in the now uh, before you start all this you know like when you as soon as you go the first things to remember are please go to your uh, the, the place where you are like let's say your uh, center is afmc pune please go a day before you know do not go on the day exam like, land up on 2 o'clock in the morning on the day of exam please go a day well at least 24 hours before go and visit your center see the center the, see who the uh, the local examiner is there'll be a name given to you contact that person register that you have come and then go and uh, stay uh, take rest in your room see uh, how much time it takes from your room to go to that exam venue you know give additional half an hour allowance in case there is a traffic jam or something like that so that you are able to reach the day of the exam comfortably sleep well the night before the exam is very very important in an osc exam you know sitting and reading late night on the night before the exam makes no sense you know, it doesn't help you in any way in other words it actually it may actually pull you down so get adequate rest a good 7 hours sleep at least the night before have a proper breakfast on the day of the exam don't go there hypoglycemic and then go and reach the exam venue at least half an hour before the examination is due to start and go and register immediately your name mark your presence presence and then you'll be asked to sit in a hall the moment uh, all of you are sit seated there then just before the exam you the examiners the panel will come meet you and uh, wish you in the morning they'll tell you you know give you the rules of the oscp exam how it is done and so on and then they you will be taken in uh, usually uh, you are asked to go and stay uh, either according to your serial number uh, or sometimes uh, lots but usually serial number and allocated to different stations and you go through the state you don't have to carry anything you know everything is provided for you inside the hall so all that you have to have is your pen uh, you know your please wear a coat you know and go a hospital coat so that you look presentable don't go with t-shirts and jeans and things not that it matters very much but you know you want to make an impression to the camera that you're a serious guy you're not uh, playing the fool you're not Mr. Romeo who's come there to uh, impress the uh, folk there so Go with a serious demeanor. So properly dressed. Uh, ideally, if you can, gentlemen, it'd be nice to have wear shoes. You know, have your uh, proper coat, possibly wear a tie, and go there. And ladies, you know, properly dressed with a coat on. So once you have uh, gone into the hall, after that you can't come out. So use the washroom before you go. You know, make yourself comfortable. So you'll be given time for all that. So once the exam starts, there's no going back. There's no going out. Nothing. All whatever you carry will be left outside. So don't be carrying uh, expensive things. You know. So you won't be allowed to carry your mobile phones inside. All that will be switched off, left outside. And then you, after the exam, the exam you come and collect it. So once the exam starts, you go from station to station and get time up, and then be, be announced to you. So every five minutes you switch over, and then you uh, go through the OC. Now there are a few very predictable stations in an OSCE exam, which you can do. One definitely there will be a clinical examination station where there will be a, a patient sitting, and you will be asked to examine the patient. It'll be one or two usually, and it will be a very specific uh, task, like saying, "Kindly uh, do an otoscopic examination of the left ear, draw the findings in a paper, and indicate the important uh, positive findings." And then there may be one or two questions along with that, saying that you know, how do you, what are the investigations, mental pre investigation for this patient, and uh, some or something like that. Or there could be a, a, a specific task, for example, you know, the patient is sitting there and you're asked to do a fistula test. So then do the fistula test. Now, even though it will be interesting for you to do an autoscopy and find out if the patient has got a cholesterol in the ear. Don't do that first. Do the uh, uh, task which is assigned to you. So if they say do a tuning fork test, do a tuning fork test. And remember, tuning fork test is always for both years. You know, it's not for one year. I've seen candidates doing 
uh, renal test in one year and then you know jumping. No, it's actually both years. So even if they say left year patient has a hearing loss, go tuning focus, you have to go tuning focus for both years. And then after that, you have time, then you can do an autoscopy examination. It is a, usually there will be an observer examiner in this kind of station. That observer examiner is there to observe your methodology of examination and then to give you marks. So as soon as you go there, wish the examiner, wish they can, can the patient, introduce yourself, say that I'm so-and-so and I've been uh, going to examine your ear. So I'll try and be gentle. So please uh, cooperate if you like. If there are gloves, please put the gloves on. And uh, now I think in the COVID days, you may also like to wear your mask on. Go there and then uh, start the examination as you can do your other things, uh, you know, when, whenever you're, uh, after doing the given task, you have time, you can tell the observer, sir, or madam, or sir, can I also do an autoscopy examination over here? I would like to do it. They can say, no, it's not necessary. You don't have to do it. They say, okay, go ahead, then do it. But that's over and above what task you have done, only after you've finished your actual task. So don't be wasting time on uh, things which are not asked because you're not going to get extra marks for that. And remember, time management is crucial, you know, because it is very, you know, carefully designed exam where only sufficient time for the task given will be there. You will not have extra time. So the luxury of sitting there and, you know, looking around and uh, talking to the, chatting with the patient and all that doesn't arise. So don't be sitting and getting a history from the patient saying that how many children do you have and things like that. So do what is asked of you. So one is the clinical station. Second, which will definitely be there, will be video station. So here, there will be a video which will be played and you will be asked to observe the video. You'll, it will only be played once. It will not be repeated second time. So don't ask them to repeat it. Say, Can I see it again? No. So only once it will be played. So when they are playing it, please observe it closely. It could be one of many things. It could be a surgical procedure. For example, it could be a posterior necrotic. Or it could be, let's say, an endoscopic repair of a CSF leak, or an endoscopic optic nerve decompression, or something like that, or an orbital decompression. Or it could be a, a microlaryngeal uh, laser procedure for, let's say, uh, a papilloma larynx. So whatever it is, the video is being played, you observe it, and then there will be a set of questions there. And the questions you have to answer. The question would be, for example, uh, what is the procedure being done? And supposing it is, a, let's say, a, a, a posterior tiparotomy, then the next question would be mention uh, two indications for this procedure. And then uh, what is the uh, uh, boundaries of the uh, facial muscles or something like that. So you actually have to answer those questions clearly and uh, give the answer paper to that particular person who's sitting there and then move on to the next issue. So this is again time management, very important. So you don't uh, say, please play the player recording again. I want to see it second time and all that will not be done for you. The third certainty definitely will be statistics. So there'll be one station definitely on statistics. And they're not going to ask you high funder stuff, but all the basic statistics, uh, uh, you know, uh, the questions you have to answer, you have to know. So look, at, look up this, this is a definite uh, station. You will also have definite stations uh, in pharmacology, bacteriology or microbiology. And uh, you could also have basic stations in uh, radiology. So you, you may have a CT scan. That is definite. You'll have a CT scan in one uh, station and next station questions will be asked about it. Yeah. So look at, look at the CT scan carefully. Don't just look at the pathology. Look at the whole thing. You know? So look at the CT scan. What view is it? Uh, what does, uh, is it axial coronal? Is it a sagittal view? Is it a CT of uh, temporal bone? Is it a CT of uh, parallel sinuses? What is the findings that you are having there? And uh, is there erosion of this, erosion of that? So then, when you go to the next station, you know you have those questions. You are position to answer those uh, questions. So radiology is another definite. Then, of course, instruments. Again, there will be a definite station, one or two, on instruments. And you can uh, have a series of instruments kept there. For example, there could be a Montgomery T tube, there may be a hoop stand, there may be a, uh, let's say, a, a, a 
an autology thing like a, a grommet or a, 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 a ear tube or something like that or a teflon piston so look at the uh, pictures there the instrument may not be there there may be pictures of the instrument so see that and then you know when you go to the next uh, they, they could be in the same station they may be asking you to identify and identify the instrument and mention what uh, surgery where it is used or something like that. so you can identify so instruments will be another definite uh, thing there uh, there may also be anatomy stations so you may have some photographs of uh, cadaveric dissections uh, for example there may be a dissection of the post bag or a dissection of the carotid sheath uh, and uh, they may be asked to identify structures like the uh, for example hypoglossal nerve or uh, vagus or spinal axillary nerve or jugular vein uh, common facial vein so, so look at these atlases mcmen actually that you know is a very good atlas is go through it page by page identify all the structures it's a very good exercise to have because it's definitely one station for you. So then, of course, there's a station of counseling. And when you go for counseling, again, you'll have an observer examiner who's sitting there. And you, you introduce yourself, you uh, greet the person, and uh, you know, you greet the patient. I would say, don't be frowning at the examiner and the patient. You're not going there for a battle or you're not going to fight with them. You're going to go there for an exam. So be pleasant, give them a pleasant smile. It's very difficult to fail a candidate who is smiling actually. The examiner's conscience will prick a bit. So be pleasant to them. And then, uh, you know, uh, tell them that, you know, I am so and so. I have come to so I have uh, come to I understand that uh, you know, there'll, be a, there'll be a small history given there saying that this lady has uh, a two year old child who's uh, been recently found to be profoundly deaf in both years. Please counsel them about how you're going to be uh, managing them. The proposed plan of action may be a cochlear implant, for example. So then tell them, you know, very nicely, uh, I'm so sorry, I heard that, you know, your child has basically found to. So empathy, you know, is part of the game. You know, you have, you you tell the uh, patient that uh, you, are, you feel sorry that, you know, the, the mother is a young lady who's sitting there very upset. So you don't want to be smart, breezing away, you know, saying that, oh, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. To say that I'm very sorry I heard that your child is easily found, but not to worry. You know we have very good solutions today, which will really help your child to come up, and uh, you can look forward to a bright future for your child. And uh, the procedure that we are planning for you is a cochlear implant. Basically, it is a, a surgical procedure where we put an implant into your inner ear, and uh, this will help your child to restore hearing, and then. Talk about uh, a little bit about the surgery, uh, you know, emphasizing all the important points, uh, particularly the procedure, the facial nerve, the, everything you have to mention. But at the same time, not making it sound scary to the mother. You know, so tell them that this is something which is done routinely, and uh, children benefit tremendously. So there has to be a positive note to your counseling. And uh, then after that, you know, you you also talk a little bit about. The post-operative uh, procedure, the habilitation, importance of that, and so on. So you have to ha make your counselling very comprehensive. At the same time, not wasting time. It must carry information. It must be reassuring to the, to the parent, and it must be uh, in, uh, given in a serious note. You know, no jokes, no cracking jokes, and things like that. So make it sound serious, so that it is uh, a meaningful dialogue with the parent. And the parent at the end of it all must feel reassured, must have sufficient knowledge, must be empowered with knowledge about the procedure. And, uh, and then, you know, there may be some one or two questions that they ask, saying that, you know, doctor, if you do the surgery, what is the failure rate? So you should be prepared for that. So you must say that, well, in a cochlear implant, there can be a device failure in up to about 3% of uh, people. Uh, but, you know, 97% uh, of them will so don't worry about it. Even if there is a device failure, we, we can always replace a device and reduce the function. So it must be uh, meaningful, it must be accurate, at the same informative, and at the same time, it must be also reassuring to the parent of your counseling station. So the counseling is uh, done in uh, one station. Um, then, uh, you know, after that, of course, the other stations depend on the examiner's uh, purview, what they have kept. But rest assured that everybody is going to go through the same station. And whatever you feel, and of course, histopathology, you know, is another one station, will definitely be on histopathology. 
So please be, you know, clear about the symptomatology of uh, common conditions which we see: malignancies, squamous cell carcinoma, uh, you know, basal cell carcinoma, uh, inverted papillomas, rhinosporidium, rhinosteroma. So be clear about the common pathologies that you're seeing. Be familiar with it so that you can diagnose and and patient the uh, and, and what um, the uh, idea is that you go through all the stations and whatever is difficult is going to be difficult for you. In general, about a third of the stations will be very easy or the oscillation will be easy and everybody will answer that. Another third of the stations will be moderately difficult. That is a good student will answer that and come out. A little thought may be necessary for those stations. Another third will be difficult, will be deliberately difficult. And these are the stations which actually test the best candidates. And uh, they are designed to make sure that, you know, the, the best candidate is rewarded for the effort of the examination. As a rule of thumb, uh, you know, you, uh, you can divide the stations into three categories. One is must know category. Knowledge has to be definitely there, must know. Supposing I say, Facial nerve, you know, it must know. You, you cannot say, I don't know about facial nerve and many other things. Second, of course, is good to know, you know, where it will be nice if the candidate knows that. For example, you know, it could be the classification of, uh, let's say, uh, glomus jugulari and uh, what are the methods of, uh, you know, what are the fish, natural skull based type of A. So that's a little more intricate, but you would expect to know. A good candidate will know that. And the third would be the, you know, excellent. And, and those are the things where, you know, you, you really don't expect the candidate to know that offhand. But, you know, maybe they've read about it somewhere. So let's say the classification of uh, the surgical uh, 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 difficulties in uh, auditory brain stem implant or uh, something like that, you know, which is really offbeat. We don't expect the candidate to know that. Uh, but if the candidate has come across that and read it and knows, then, you know, definitely that candidate gets more marks and gets rewarded for that. So basically, you can divide this into, uh, you know, must know, good to know, and excellent to know. Must know category of stations will always carry negative marks. The good to know can, categories, some of them may carry negative marks, some of the questions. The excellent to know will not have a negative mark. So in the end, you can take a guess, you can take a wild guess, but the other two don't take a guess because you could be actually losing marks in the process of guessing. So unless you know for sure, don't, uh, you know, guess. so when you look at the question, you should be able to grade the difficulty of the question yourself. Is it a must know category or is it a good to know category or is it an excellent to know category? And then you can put, uh, you know, the, the thought of guessing can come in after that. So you have to, to some extent assess the uh, question also and the difficulty of the question before you attempt that wild guesses. If it's an educated guess, you know, where, it's, uh, where you know the answer and you think that's the answer, but maybe, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure, I'm only 80% sure. Yes, if it's, uh, you know, good to know, uh, yes, you can take a guess in that uh, category of but must know, you have to know definitely. You can't be guessing there with 80%. So this is uh, regarding the, uh, you know, the station, how we are going to approach uh, the station. So time management is important. Learning to assess the grading of the uh, difficulty of the uh, station they're going. But don't get disheartened if you don't know the answer to a particular station. Because if you don't know, chances are most people won't know. So if you're a good candidate, if you're a sincere candidate, if you don't know the answer to a particular station, you can rest assured that a large number of uh, people are going to be uh, having this problem. Now, what about the Viva? You know, so you will have four Viva stations as part of the OSCE. Although the Viva marks are not added on to the OSCE, I'll come to that later. But the, you will have the four Vivas as part of the it could be five minute vivas or it could be 10 minutes depending on how much time you have for each station. Uh, so if you, let's say you have a, a viva on autology, you'll have one on autology, you'll have one on rhinology, one on head and neck, and one on research answers. 
the questions which are asked are the same questions which are asked for every year. So the examiners will have a set of questions they have prepared and they will shoot the questions to you and then you will answer. As soon as you go to the Viva station, tell them uh, morning sir, or afternoon sir, or whatever, and then uh, they tell you to take a seat, you have a seat. And uh, they may ask uh, initially, where are you from? Where did you train? And things like that. So maybe a, a few words of introduction from the site may be required. Uh, so tell them that I trained at, uh, let's say, Pune and AFMC. Uh, are you a post MS candidate or are you a direct candidate? All those kind of things they'll ask you. Then it's not that they're going to ask you different questions. You could be a post MS, the same question they're going to be asked. So you don't have to be thinking and, you know, should I say post MS or not say, you don't have to worry about all that. The questions which will be asked are the same. Now, each uh, station that may be, uh, say, a Viva station, the examiner may have prepared 20 questions. Now, if you don't know the answer, please say, I'll pass, uh, I'm not sure. They'll ask the next question. So the more questions you answer, the more marks you get. So don't be sitting and contemplating and philosophizing over one question for a long time. If you don't know the answer, please say, oh, sorry, sir, I but you can, if you know something connected with it, you can then say that. For example, let's say that, you know, you're asking about, somebody's asking about, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, let's say classification. Tell us the classification of a discussed cochlea. Now, you don't know, remember the classification. And, you, know, you're, you are a little uh, doubtful about that. But you know that uh, you have heard about modernity deformity and mature deformity. So you can always say, sir, I'm not, uh, the exact classification I know, sir, but it's not coming to my mind, I've got a block, but I know that uh, you can have a complete absence, in which case it's called a complete deformity. It can be a partial uh, dysplasia or some more. Then the examiner will know that you have read about it, and they may then offer you some clues, and uh, you can then uh, take up on those clues. So if, if you know something about it, you can talk about it, but if you don't know anything about it, Ask the darn question and go on to the next question. And the uh, more questions you answer correctly, the more marks you get in the Viva. So that's how the Viva station is answered. Now, the marks from the Viva don't get added on to the OSCE. The OSCE stations are minus the Viva station. The afternoon, you will be, uh, this is let's say in the morning, in the afternoon, you have your clinical exam. And in the clinical exam, you know, you there, there may be, let's say, uh, six stations. In each station, there may be two examiners. Now, you go and pick up a lot, and let's say the lot says you are in uh, number number three. So you go to uh, patient number three, and you examine the patient number three. Now, this is neither a long case nor a short case; it's an intermediate case. So you take a brief history. You are given, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, thirty minutes to examine the candidate or the patient. And you examine the patient, you get the history, you do an internal endoscopy, you do this, that, so get a full history. And then after that, uh, you, you then go to the examiner. Examiner, you'll spend 15 minutes with the examiner. And uh, usually it is actually 15 minutes for examination of the, of the patient and 15 minutes for the examiner. And with the examiner, they will uh, start off in, in different ways. You know, they can, they can ask you to present the case, if you present the case. You have time to write down about the things or write down. If there's a, let's say, a drawing that you can draw, draw a diagram. Let's say, see a larynx, you can draw a diagram showing where is the lesion. Or a, a ear finding, you can draw a diagram with the panic and the findings and more. So keep it there. But before you go to the examiner, think carefully. What is, what is my diagnosis? Why am I thinking about the differential diagnosis? What am I going to do next? How am I going to approach this patient? What am I doing? So am I going to do a, a microscopy examination or an autoendoscopy to confirm my findings? Am I then uh, you know, going to ask for a, a CT scan? Uh, if so, why am I asking for a CT scan? What do I expect to see in a CT scan? Then if I'm going to be doing uh, uh, investigations, what are the investigations that are relevant in this patient? And then what is the procedure that I have to do? I have to, let's say a direct laryngoscopy and biopsy. How am I going to do it? Am I going to do it with local anesthesia or general anesthesia? Why? GAY, LAY. And then after doing the biopsy, then what's the next stage? Once it's a moderate differential carcinoma, what do I do? If it 
comes as a tuberculosis issue, what do I do? You know, so think of all the probabilities, go through it in your mind. And then, you know, go to the examiner so that you're prepared. And then many other things you're thought about will be what the examiner will be asking. Of course, they can go off in a tangent, you know. So let's say you are talking about a CSI with cholesteroma. You go to the examiner and the patient has got a mild grade 2 facial weakness. Go to the examiner. The examiner may completely take off and say that, look, tell me about the grades of uh, facial nerve gas you know, policy and go off into a tangent into the facial nerve. So this is the prerogative of the examiner. But generally speaking, you will start off somewhere and go. The more difficult your questions with the examiner, the, the better it is. It's a good sign. It's, it's a good sign that you are doing well. So don't get disturbed by that. You know, the, a good candidate will be asked all sorts of difficult questions. And they'll be coming. So it doesn't mean that you're doing badly. It means you're doing well. So you should get more worried if somebody asks you something like, you know, please tell me uh, how are you going to do a Weber test in this patient. Uh, then that's a bad sign. That means that the examiner's got a rather low opinion about your performance so far. So basically, the more difficult the questions, the better you are doing. So you don't have to get too disturbed by the examiner when they ask you tough questions. So 15 minutes of this. So this mark, which you get from this clinical exam, is then added on to your viral marks. And you have to pass that separately. So generally speaking, you have to pass your OSCE separately. You have to pass your clinical exam and viva separately. And uh, then, of course, overall pass. Uh, sometimes, in moderation, you know, if the OSCE is extremely difficult, the examiners may, battle, may feel that you, know, you may have some moderation but that's not a rule. That's an exception. So don't bank on that. So be prepared that you have to pass each part separately and then come out of it. In general, more than nowadays, I think you know, most of the candidates pass in a DNB. More candidates pass than fail. Let me say that. About 60% of the candidates will pass the information, which is very good. Because in, in most exams uh, abroad, if you see, let's say the Royal College of Surgeons or uh, the uh, Royal College of Surgeons of Canada or the American Board, uh, the Australian uh, College of Surgeons, uh, you know, the, the pass rate is something like three to four percent, not more than that. So, you know, we are pretty good, I would say, in our pass rate. So, it's a tough exam. DNP is the toughest exam in the country. But it's an exam which is worth passing, and a good candidate will pass. Now, there's nothing like reading for an OSCE. You know, you cannot read a textbook for OSCE. You know, some of the things, of course, you know, things like you know, instruments and all that you have to check up uh, before you go. But there's nothing much you can read. Uh, it actually comes from your clinical experience and your experience in the day to day ward practice and so on. So, therefore, you have to have a, a, a complete knowledge of your subject. Yes, at the same time, it's also a practical exam. It's a real-time exam. So you, you, it assesses your real-time knowledge. And uh, a good candidate who has been sincere, worked in the wards, worked in the outpatient, worked in the operating theater, assisted cases and so on, will generally pass through without much hassle. He'll pass through the exam quite happily. So don't get too disturbed. Uh, you know, you will definitely have a pretty good chance of passing, I think, uh, more chance of passing than failing, if you have sincere in your, uh, uh, I'll quickly go through some of the questions, you know, Pratik, you let me know whenever I have to stop, because, uh, you know, you can, you can go on and on about this. So the first, somebody asked me how to answer viva question. So I think we looked at it, you know, you go wish the examiner sit straight and answer as, uh, you know, if you know the question, answer the question. If you don't know at all, pass the question. If you have some vague idea about it, you can tell them that, you know, I, I know this, sir, but I've somehow I've forgotten about the other one. Now, examiners are sympathetic. Examiners are not monsters, you know, they're all there to help you. Not to, they, after all, the examiners are happy if you, they pass you. You know, I, whenever I meet a person and he comes and tells me, sir, I was your uh, student, you are my examiner. Uh, my first thought is, oh, my God, I hope I pass the guy. So, uh, you don't want to just meet somebody whom you fail. So basically, the examiner also wants to pass you. you know? uh, but at the same time, you must deserve to pass. You know, the examiner is not uh, here to uh, you know, let everybody out uh, to an unsuspecting population. So you want people to 
earn their uh, pass and go out and be good in their work. Many, many years ago, when I was a uh, FRC's examiner, uh, you know, for the first time, I think it was 1980s, uh, we were given a briefing by the chief examiner. And it was a very simple briefing, and I still love that briefing. I even tell this to other examiners. So the briefing was, for the final exam, FRC's exam, briefing was, if this candidate is applying for a local position, you want to go on a long leave for three months. If this candidate is applying for a local position to occupy your chair, would you be comfortable giving him that local position? If so, pass it. In other words, is he safe or is he a dangerous guy? Now, supposing, you know, you ask him a question like, you know, this uh, patient has got a, a temporal bone malignancy which involvement of the skull base and, uh, you know, he's got a facial palsy, he's got no amount of the parotid and it is evolving into the uh, uh, paraspinal uh, extension into the paraspinal region and uh, uh, with the extension into the dura of the CP angle. How are you going to manage the patient? If the candidate says, sir, this is uh, beyond me, it's, it's a very difficult thing, and to me, it looks like a very uh, inoperable situation. Who would definitely like to get an opinion from a, a more experienced person? I'll be sending it to an, an opinion from an oncologist, from radiation oncologist, and then also from senior surgeons who have had experience with this. Then that candidate is likely to pass rather than a fellow who says, I'm going to take out half the brain and you know, a little bit of the brain stem and a bit of this uh, you know, and half of his neck. You are not very happy with that candidate. So, end of the day, a safe candidate is is what you are looking for. So, this is a very simple rule of thumb. You know, this candidate who's sitting in front of you, would you put him in your chair for three months and go away and come back, or when you come back, will your chair not be there anymore? You know, so that's the simple uh, way of looking at it. So, skill station, how to correctly approach? I think we have, we have uh, talked about it. Uh, how is the mark distribution for OSCE stations? I think, does each OSCE station carry the same marks? No, no, definitely not. Each OSCE station is marked on its own merit. It may not necessarily carry the same marks. In general, there may be a, a distribution which is more or less equal, but not all of them have equal weightage. What if there's a language barrier? Well, you can always have interpreters. You, know, you can always ask for interpreters. Every examination hall will have interpreters. For example, if you have an examination happening in Tamil Nadu, uh, the patient may only speak Tamil and you may not know Tamil. Please ask for an interpreter. The interpreter will be somebody who will be knowledgeable and very often it will be either as a, a senior resident in the department, a doctor, or an assistant or somebody will be there and they'll ask you, they will interpret and tell you, you know, whatever question you ask. But they will not tell you uh, questions which you don't ask. You. So you have to ask the questions and they will. When you decide to give negative marks, I told you already, you know, the simpler the station, the more chances of it carrying negative marks. So if you're not too sure of the answer, evaluate this severity of the uh, degree of difficulty. Supposing it's a very difficult question, which you know that, you know, most people are not going to answer, then you can have a guess at it. So that will be a uh, chances of negative mark is less. If the question is, uh, discuss the candidacy for CI. What should be the correct answer? How to avoid negative marks? Well, it's very simple. You know, if you're a candidate for CI, I would classify it into absolute indications and relative indications. Then talk about each one of this. So you say that this is a, an absolute indication. I have to do all this. And if you say the relative indication, you talk about relative indication. So that's how you look at each one. And let's look at the next. Uh, what books to follow or cite in Viva or Kepler? You are not expected to cite any books in, uh, in Viva. You know, that's not what is asked of you. you are, it's an assessment of your factual knowledge. So you just have to talk about the uh, information that you have. You don't have to say, oh, according to uh, you know, comments, it's like this, or according to Scott Brown, uh, eighth edition, it's like this. Or, uh, no, that's not what is expected. Please don't do all that. You are not required to cite any uh, uh, books. What should we bring to our examination set? Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. You know, just your pen and you know, and your knowledge. Nothing more. But you're not expected to bring any instruments, or scope, this, that, nothing. Everything will be provided. How to do counseling to get full marks? I think we again went through that. You know, so how do you approach a counseling station? You talk about uh, the essential things. You have to introduce yourself, wish the examiner who's there as well as the uh, patient. 
you are going to talk about the uh, condition, give information to the uh, person, but at the same time, it has to be you know, with a bit of empathy and uh, giving all the information to the relevant people. Uh, how many case presentations we have to do and how to get full marks? I'm not really sure about this question. You know, are they asking about how many case presentations I'm going to do before I go for the exam to get practice? Well, you know, do as many as you can uh, and, and uh, be clear and thorough. You should be very, very thorough about your case presentations. And uh, you, you, there should not be any confusion there. You must be very clear about the session. must come fluently. So practice you know, well before you go many, many times, present to your senior, present to your uh, professor, amongst yourselves, be very comfortable in your case presentation before you go. How to rectify a mistake during examination? Well, in an OSCE exam, you cannot, you know, you've done the station, you've gone to the next station, you cannot go back. So there's no question of rectifying. Once you cross the station, you cross the station. If you're in that station and you've still got time, then you can rectify it, but not if you're not. How to avoid thought block during Viva? The best answer is that you sleep very well the night before. You are comfortable, you're not uh, stressed out, and go there. See, after all, this is the toughest exam in the, in the country. You may pass or you may fail. Nobody's going to drop your neck off. So it's not a, as if it's a disaster. So don't go with that kind of stress levels. You know, say, go there with the feeling that I'm going to be fine. You know, I'm going to do my best. Let's see what happens. So that's the right approach to go through. Don't don't uh, go there, you know, with all sorts of uh, stress built into you. There's no compulsion that you have to pass the first time. You know, it's not. There's no undertaking. Don't pass the first time. Nobody, when you when you're sitting and practicing as a consultant, nobody's going to come and ask you how many times did you write the exam before you got your qualification. Nobody's going to come over. All these exams are only a license. And in the long term, in the real life, you know, these exams won't matter at all. Let me tell you that. What matters is your knowledge and your skills and your ability to communicate. So that's all that there is to it in life. So don't get too stressed out about exams. It's a necessary hurdle for you to cross. It's a license for you to allow you to proceed further. But that's about it. Not anything more than that. So don't get too worried about this. I like this question. Does an anxious face during the viva affect person? <laughs> yes, the body language is important. The candidate who comes and smiles, and relaxes, and talks is definitely a winner. You know, no doubt about it. Uh, I have failed candidates, uh, I must say, because they came and started crying in the exam. Because to me, uh, the part of the uh, uh, importance of the exam is to test the attitude of the if under stress, a candidate will break down. He's a poor candidate for a surgeon. Now, what if you're after doing an active section and, and the carotid gets nicked or something? You know, you're going to sit there and cry. Candidate, the patient is dead. So, you know, you uh, uh, like a surgeon is a person who learns to bite the bullet. You know, is somebody who can stand in adversity, face it to the best of his or her abilities, and come out of it. You know, so that's a surgeon. So that attitude is very important. The mental fortitude and the attitude is what you have. So sitting there looking as though you're ready to burst into tears doesn't help. It certainly doesn't Oh, no candidate, no examiner is going to be sympathetic towards a candidate like that. They expect the candidate to answer straight. Always look at the examiner's face and answer. Eye contact is very important. Body language is very important. So as somebody who is, uh, you know, pleasant, looking at the eye of the examiner, answering the point is the winner, definitely. How to manage time when writing the theory? Because I think we went through this actually. Time management is part of the exam. So somebody sitting there and writing Rama and the theory is not going to get much. So learn to make it brief. I told you about the outlines in which you have headings, subheadings, keywords, all underlined. Also, the examiner can go through that. Then also have, uh, whenever you're writing, write, learn to write in short answers, uh, not the sentences. So that saves time. Well, you don't have to make long, grammatically complicated uh, sentences. So learn to manage because time management is part of the examination. After all, if a particular, let's say, a theory paper, a theory question asked, and if uh, one candidate answers that 
and another candidate has no time to answer that. The candidate who answers that gets more marks because obviously that candidate knew better than the other candidate. The examiner is not here to probe into your mind and know your knowledge, but what you are able to communicate at the time given to you. So time management is part of the exam. And you cannot say, I come out and say I didn't have time. That means that you're, a, you're not prepared for the exam. Does the language in the answer sheet have to be the same than the books? No, not at all. You write in your words. And in fact, it doesn't have to be long sentences. Just make it brief, your own words, convey the information, and if possible, keep it short. Keep short answers, keep bullets small. Highlighting, does highlighting or not doing the effects cause? It's not required. You know, you can underline, it's just underline. That's all you can. Don't waste some time on things where you can do uh, without. So highlighting does not mean the exam is not blind. So just underline it, and uh, that should be enough. If you want to emphasize a particular point, underline it. So, uh, if we feel that we could write an already attempted answer in a better way, what should we do? Well, you know, you've already answered here, and there's nothing we can do about it. When you rewrite the answer, or whatever, only if you're in the same station in OSCE, and you still have time, you can do that. You can score that out and write it. But you can't do that if you've crossed the station. In essay type question, does a number of pages written matter? No, not at all. But uh, you know, a candidate who writes uh, the same matter information short way, presentable way in bullets, I know definitely is possible. Another thing which none of you have talked about, and I should talk about, is your handwriting. You know, don't speak it for heaven's sake. The examiner doesn't want to be sitting there with a bottle of uh, you know Amritanjan and then correcting your paper. So keep your uh, answers legible. It doesn't have to be beautiful handwriting. Some people are gifted with beautiful handwriting and always the pressure to write, uh, evaluate a paper like that. But I think it should be legible, you know, not scribble. That, you know, examiners, I've had situations where I've actually had key paper when the candidate came for the viva, given it to them and said, please read your answer. And evaluate it. Now that doesn't augur very well. You know, the examiner is already in a, in a pretty bad mood when you come. So don't, don't, uh, right? If your handwriting is bad, please, Get copywriting notebooks and spend uh, every day half an hour improving your handwriting. It's well worth it. Uh, writing answers, especially for short notes, should be write, write it as points or as paragraphs. And points are fine. You know, you can write bullets, points, you know, and then that, that's good enough. Uh, is the writing the answers in the same order as the question has said? Will it affect the marks? Well, as far as possible, stick to the same order. You know, if you're jumping from question one to five and then back to three, examiner has to spend a little bit of time looking at the answer and then you know marking it separately. A little bit of extra effort for that. After all, the idea is to keep the examiner happy, right? It's a question of satisfying the examiner. In fact, the Royal College of Surgeons, when you pass, they will not say you pass the exam. They will say that having satisfied the board of examiners, you are now found fit to enter the Royal College of Surgeons. So that's how they will say it's only satisfying the examiner. It's not a question of Really passing him. So keep the examiner happy as far as possible. While writing uh, drawing diagrams, necessary to use multiple colors, especially if time does not. No, not at all. No, don't have to worry about colors. Line diagrams will be more than enough and you can label it. There are some diagrams that you have to practice well at all. For example, the facial nerve, anatomy of the facial nerve, anatomy of the sphenoid sinus and cavernous sinus, and this relationship, structures under cover of the myelohyoid. The floor of the mouth. So, you know, things like the orbital apex. So, all these diagrams well in advance, be familiar with it, uh, crowded sheet, and so on. So, and be clear about this uh, diagram. So, you're, you know, you're not going there and imagining for the first time and drawing. So, practice them before you go. And uh, if the line diagrams are fine, label the parts. You don't have to be artistic. The idea is that you convey to the examiner that you're clear about the anatomy. A few tips for success finally is to make the most you know, of your time during the DNB course. Optimal use of time during the DNB examination. And in your course, use the time you know, constructively. Every day, learn one fact in your course. So, you know, this is what you have to do. Every day, learn one fact. And in fact, when I was a postgraduate, I used to have uh, a method of doing it. I'll share it with you. What I used to do was I used to have a file. And in the file, I used to have different uh, topics. For example, auto students, or many of this is another topic. So whatever I read, and some, I'll, I'll write that topic and I'll file it in that particular system. So it'll be there with some reference if it is from a particular book. I know I can go back and look at it if required. 
And then if I read a journal and I find an article which is relevant to that, I'll take that reference also and put it up in that. So end of it all, you have this folder with you know, different uh, uh, topics. Topic you've got so many information. Take down several books. I also used to have a short pocket notebook, which uh, I would just write the salient, uh, you know, uh, points in pocket notebook on each topic, uh, taken from this folder and keep in my pocket. So the day before the exam, I just look at the short uh, book and then go through that, and then uh, not the entire folder there. So this used to be my way of it, but you'll have your own method of preparation. So do that. But end of the day, you know, use the, your course to learn about something every day. That's the whole idea. Be focused. Don't be wasting your time. Hard work pays. So read, 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 read. Very, very important. And don't study solo. You know, always it's good to read with somebody else. It could be a senior. It could be your junior. It could be your colleague. But always read with somebody and share with somebody, discuss with somebody. The best way of reading or of learning is by teaching. That's the best way of learning. So if you're teaching somebody a topic or you're talking about a topic to somebody else, you read and that stick with your head in your head. It'll never leave you. So you can wonder, you may wonder how you know your professors after so many years are still able to remember all this. It's simply because they've been talking about it for so many times. So you know that's the only way it stays in your mind. So Learn to always combine uh, with your friends and then do a combined study. Deal with your stress. Don't get caught. Now, they told you nothing is going to happen if you fail your exam. Nobody is going to kill you. Some of the very good surgeons I know are people who have you know, taken their own time to pass the examination. And they are no less successful because of that. So success in life doesn't you know, mean anything. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, how, how many, how many distinct Nothing of the sort. So please don't get stressed out. Uh, the exam. Go there, do your best. You know, prepare well, do your best. And you know, if things are working out well in your favor, everything is good. Some things, sometimes it may not be your day. That's not a disaster. You know, it's not the end of the world or something. You definitely have to do it six months later, but you'll come out of it successfully. Uh, I, I remember very well. One candidate came. You know, uh, once before we had OSCE. Uh, I was asked to examine in a very reputed institution and it came with very high influence. You know, father was um, a secretary to the government and that level, this, that. So this minister found up, that minister found up. The local examiner was very stressed out to the candidate. And the candidate came and uh, when I answered, uh, asked questions, uh, she was not able to answer anything at all. So end of the day, a whole day I've been, I've been asking and this is one disaster after the other. So in the afternoon, in the final viva, I asked her some question and she said, I don't know. So I told her, this is the first correct answer you have given me the whole day. So then I said, do you think I should pass you at the end of it all? She looked at me, I said, I'm sorry, my dear, I cannot. So you have to go and read up about the subject and come back next year. Next time she came and believe me, next time she was absolutely brilliant. She answered everything she went through, passed and, and sailed through the whole exam. And then much later, when I met her, you know, as a consultant, much later, she told me, sir, the first time you passed, you failed me. I felt very bitter. But then I went and I said, they'll take this challenge. You know, I'm going to go to this man again and prove that I'm worth it. So I, then that uh, changed my whole career. So till then, I had not taken my life seriously. That changed my career path and I, I owe a lot to you. So I said, no, you don't owe anything to me. You owe it to me yourself. It's just that, you know, you had to have the realization that you had to be good. Not just passing an exam, but good within yourself. That's what you learn. So end of the day, that's what it is. You know, it's, it's to learn to deal with yourself and to introspect and to be able to satisfy yourself first of all before you even satisfy the exam. So organize yourself. It's very important to organize yourself. You know, every day have a program for yourself and go through that program. I used to do that all my student days, right? From my first year at BBS. I was organized. I used to study the same number of hours, whether I went to the first day of the course, the day after the exam. For the next year, I would start off the day after the exam. I never studied late at night for any day. I uh, never went to stress out before the exam. So I always kept the same study plan. Helped me a lot. You know, never to get stressed. So organize yourself. Don't prioritize any one topic. You may like one topic very well, you know, but it doesn't mean you spend all your time reading about it. You have to know everything. You get equal time. 
theory and OSCE, know about surgical procedures. If a particular surgery is asked in your theory, you know, supposing they say, describe uh, the posterior temporotomy operation, don't straight away jump and say, posterior temporotomy operation is done by postauricular approach or is it? don't do that. So you have to first, any op surgeries, first talk about the history of the surgery, the nomenclature of the surgery, a little bit about the instrumentation, a little bit about the anesthesia, position of the patient, draping of the patient, then the incisions that you are going to be doing, then the actual surgical work, and then after that, the complications of the surgery and how to deal with the complications. So that's how uh, a question is asked. It must, be, it must be very, very comprehensive. It must be holistic. So you will think about in a larger frame of mind, not just look at that one operation and say, I am going to do a cardiac cardiomastectomy, and then patient is much more than that. Rest your brain, but most importantly, use your brain. So that's the last uh, tip that I want to give. But both are important. Resting your brain when you need to rest and using your brain when you need to. So all the best for your future. I hope you know this is giving you some tips for how to approach the exam. But be confident. You know the examiners are not your enemies. The examiners are there to help you to pass. And this must be clear about it. I am yet to meet an examiner in DMP whom I would describe as vicious. I am yet to meet one. And all the examiners I have met, both seniors and junior examiners I have seen, all been people who have been quite pleasant and benevolent. And you know they feel bad when uh, the results are not good or when a particular candidate fails. They feel pretty bad. So don't don't go with that approach that no these people are all villains. You know something that will kill me. No, no, not at all. They are all there, your friends, trying to help you to pass achieve your goals because that makes you happy and it also makes them happy when, when they give you a good result. So this is really the uh, approach that you should have when you go to the exam. Okay. Now if there are any other questions, Pratik, you please feel free to ask me. I'm not sure about time. I think I've exceeded my time. No, okay. sir. Actually, we are spellbound, sir. Nobody has left this room, sir. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, I think. Okay, that, that's a good, good practice with the exam because when you're going to the exam, you can't leave the room. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but so, you have gone through that. Maybe you should say something about your experience. Sir, uh, mm, you took my uh, recent advances, Viva, sir. Okay. And uh, you asked me different levels of questions. So, uh, in the end, you asked me, do you know anything about vestibular implants? Okay. So, uh, and you told me, if you answer this question, I will give you extra marks. <laughs> so, <laughs> actually, at that time, uh, I just saw a presentation of Dr. Srinivas Dorasala uh, right. and here he mentioned about vestibular implant like three years back. Right. So I mentioned it to you exactly that, uh, sir, I don't know much about vestibular implant, but I know that it is used for bilateral vestibulopathy or, uh, yes. and it is, yes, sir. And it is uh, done by uh, Dr. Srinivas. So that was my experience. And uh, uh, it was really hard, sir, and uh, we were actually clueless about how to approach some stations and how to go. Like, uh, we have a question, like, should we carry a logbook and our thesis also? To the yes, OSCE? you should, you should, you should. They'll be collected from you. As soon as you go to the register your name, the examiners will collect it from you. The chief examiner will collect the logbook and your thesis. And as part of the viva, usually, you know, in one of the stations, either it could be the uh, recent advances or notology, they may ask you about your thesis. It's up to, up to them. Not compulsory, but if there's a particular thesis which is very fascinating or if there's a particular thesis which is uh, a little uh, substandard, then they may ask you questions about that. But generally speaking, you know, the in one of the stations, the examiner is specially empowered to ask about your thesis if required. They've all gone through your thesis. Yes, sir. Uh, there is a most popular question, sir. I think I got it like uh, 20 times. When can we expect our final Lossky exams for this session? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I don't think even the national board knows. You know, so That's the honest answer. Because you know that times are different now. You know, we have a yes, new norm. Yes. We are a new world. The idea is that we want to conduct an exam. We don't even know how to conduct it. Very honest with you. And this is not only the national board, this is a situation mm -hmm. of all the examining bodies all over the world. 
field, the Royal College. You know, yesterday, I got a communication from the Royal College of Surgeons saying that they are still looking at methods of conducting Royal College of Surgeons examination, which is possible. So, you know, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a new uh, experience for everybody. But I, I think, you know, we'll get out of this in, uh, in a few months, in a few months' time. Maybe it will be deferred a little bit, but uh, not too long. Uh, so I think you should be prepared. Any time, you be prepared any time from your point of view. But, uh, you know, the moment some uh, kind of uh, clarity comes, then, uh, you know, the first of all, we must be able to get the exam candidates to be able to move from place to place. Yes. So all that is possible. Or we'll have to think about virtual examination techniques which may come up. But uh, it, nobody is clear. Even the Royal National Board is still thinking about it. It's very much, very well seized of the problem. They've been discussing about it. In fact, all of us have had uh, discussions. But uh, you know, there's still no final uh, answer to this. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, how this COVID situation is going to hamper our clinical examination or the OSCE station? That's right. It's going to be definitely an issue. Because you know you you have to be uh, looking at protection, you have to be looking at uh, social distancing. All that will have to be done, you know, as a proper uh, protection kits and everything. So that's why I said that it may take a you know a little while before some kind of clarity emerges. Mm -hmm. But I would expect that you know candidates will all be given protection kits to go through. You know, you may be asked to wear uh, mask and gloves and round uh, cap. Mm -hmm. Go through the uh, exam, and, and uh, when you're sitting in the front of the examiner, you may be maintaining two meter distance. So, possible, all this is a possible new world we are in. Sir, uh, Dr. Chandrika is asking uh, during the OSCE examination, can we use abbreviations like uh, CTPNS instead of computer? Yeah, yeah, you can if it's standard, if it's standard abbreviations, mm -hmm. but don't be using you know some funny abbreviation. Uh, sometimes you come across funny abbreviation. And you have to ask them what are you talking about, and then they'll tell you something. So mm. please use standard abbreviations, which are you know uh, known all over the world. So Dr. Sushil is asking from where we should study for OSCE exam. Are there any particular books? No, you can't study for OSCE exam. That's what I told you. You can never study for OSCE exam. You study for OSCE examination on a daily basis in your ward, with your outpatient clinic, in your surgical uh, exposure. That's how you study. Your study is actually your training. So there's no book which will tell you about OSCE. You can't. That's not a way to read. Uh, sir, uh, sir, are we supposed, Dr. Chandrika is asking, are we supposed to talk about the procedure being done while performing in the skill station? Should we explain the procedure? Yeah, yeah, you will. You will. In fact, the questions will be very clear. Let's say, for example, you know, your uh, one of the exams I can give you, you know, somebody had uh, one station was, please uh, assemble this uh, instrument. There's a Humvee knife. Uh, we were taking a specific graph, you know, uh, 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 assemble this instrument and then uh, take a, a, a peel from this. There was a cucumber, you take a peel from that and then mention, uh, you know, when you will be using it and which situation. So, here, there are many, many tasks. So you first go there with the examiner, put your gloves on, find the Humvee knife with this assembly, you take it, put the blade in the proper way, you know, connect it, you know, so adjust uh, the, the thickness that you want to take, and then take your shaving from there, and then show it to the examiner. And then tell the examiner, sir, madam, sir, uh, you know, this is how a split skin graft is taken. I may be using a split skin graft in this situation or that situation. Uh, you know, so, so something like that. So, end of the day, this is a, a, te a style, technique uh, which you, if you have been in theater and you've seen it being done, then you go through. If you're not seen it at all in your life, then you know, you're not going to be able to do it. So, I've, I've seen candidates putting the knife, the blade, the opposite way, you know, struggling and all that. That doesn't speak to you well. But, end of the day, it is a, 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 a task which you have to be talking to the exam. Telling them that there'll be an observer examiner at that station, and the examiner will be looking at you, and you know you have to talk to them and tell them, "This is what I'm going to be doing, sir, and this is what I plan to do, and this is what I do." Yes, sir. Uh, uh, like for this patient, should we take consent also for the no, no. from the patient? No, it's just tell the patient. You know, I talk to the patient. Look, yeah. okay, I'm going mm -hmm. to. 
to this procedure. For example, if you're going to be asked, they ask you to do a dick solving maneuver on a patient. Hmm. Don't go jump and catch it and push it down onto the floor. You must tell him, look, I'm going to be doing this and you may feel a bit giddy. Please don't get worried. Keep your eyes open. Look straight ahead. And uh, don't get alarmed. And if you feel giddy, I'm next to you. I won't let you down. I'll be holding you. So reassure the patient. Then do the dick solving. Anyway, you know, so don't judge and if the, if the question is please do a dick solve bike maneuver don't jump and catch the head of the patient and put him down onto the floor so you want to describe it to him tell him what you're going to do reassure him and then do it and uh, you know that's how you do it yes sir uh, dr mike negi is asking from where to study for recent advances <laughs> good, good question there's nothing like that, you know. It's uh, I think you can answer that thing much better than me. But you know, the recent advance is not from any book. It's it's uh, based yeah. on multiple things. For example, you know, there may be uh, questions on uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies. There may be questions from genetics. There may be questions from uh, uh, some surgical procedure. You know, come up, or there may be something about some new uh, instrument, like you said about vestibular implants. Same things like that. So it's not uh, in one book. No one book will carry information. Yes, it's from wide reading. And that's the whole idea of the uh, recent advances. So why, why? You know, it just assess the, the depth and the breadth of knowledge of the candidate. Yes, sir. Sir, I think uh, we have finished the questions and you have clearly explained each and every step and each and every doubt a uh, candidate can have in their mind. So I would like to thank you so much for Indeed. coming and joining us. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sriharsha for arranging all these things. And uh, thank you all the participants. And uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you, Pratik. I enjoyed it. I hope it was useful to all of you. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. All thank the best. So all the best to the exam. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Sir.